All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar on Braille Literacy. With us today, we have two co-hosts. We have Jen Golden and Natalie Martiniello from Braille Literacy Canada to present to us, or talk to us anyway, about Braille Literacy. There won't be a video presentation, so it's just going to be them um, talking to us about Braille and the importance of Braille. So I'm going to pass it over to them. Well, I was about to say good afternoon, everyone, but I realize it might be good morning to some of you. Um, I, Natalie and I will just start by uh, giving a little bit of an intro of, uh, of who we are. I'm Jen Golden, and I am currently the president of Braille Literacy Canada, and I um, work as a quality assurance specialist with a company called Crawford Technologies. And um, so I guess, before we sort of do our intro, we're going to do a little bit of intro to Braille as well. But before I do do that, um, I'll uh, let Natalie introduce herself as well. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Martiniello. I am the secretary um, for Braille Literacy Canada. I've been involved since 2012. And I'm also a, a vision rehabilitation specialist in the Montreal area. So I've taught Braille. Um, and technology to clients of different ages. So we're, we're happy to have everyone here with us today, and we're very excited to talk about Braille, as always. <laughs> so um, just to give a bit of an intro again, because we're not, we're not really sure um, who we have on the webinar and, and what your background is in, in Braille. So I'll just give you a brief outline of what it is. Um, it uh, consists of what are called cells. They're groups of six dots. and different configurations of these six dots uh, are used to represent letters and symbols and, and all kinds of uh, all kinds of good things so and that kind of ties into um, an explanation of the the different types of braille there's contracted and uncontracted and uncontracted is sort of the alphabet and numbers and punctuation and contracted braille consists also of symbols that you might kind of compare them to shorthand where one symbol will represent um, a number of letters or or an entire word as well. So um, again, just kind of an outline of Braille. Another thing to note in at this time is that Braille is not a language, it's a writing system. And just to kind of clarify why we felt this is important is that the fact that it's a writing system and not a language really connects to um, it helps sort of explain the role of Braille and, and kind of relates to, to some, I guess, myths and misconceptions that Natalie will talk about later. So um, we just wanted to sort of get that, um, sort of mention that in the beginning when we're giving you a bit of an, an outline of Braille. So Natalie's going to talk about why Braille is important for kids. Perfect. So before I get into that, I thought it would be useful um, to just rewind for a moment and provide a bit more context, um, particularly for those of you who, who aren't familiar with some of the history of Braille and how we got to where we are today. Um, before the 1700s, Braille ch children were actually not educated, and not, not a lot of people realize that, but for the most part, um, many people believe that they could not be educated and that they could not be literate. So throughout history, what we have are examples of blind people who were relegated to a life of poverty and begging um, and reliance on charity. Um, and it's not surprising because we know today that literacy is an absolute requirement to succeed in uh, society on an equal footing with other citizens. So if you're illiterate, you have far more uh, opportunities to do that. Then the first school for the blind was opened in, um, in France in the late 1700s. And then in the mid 1800s, Braille was introduced. And for the first time, it was it was recognized that blind uh, children and adults could learn that they could be literate, and this was a real shifting point because it completely changed the story for um, blind people, uh, particularly in the Western world, and it and it really changed um, 
the reality for future generations um, of blind people as well. If blind people could be literate, then they could be educated. And if you can be educated, you can, you know, attain higher levels of employment. And so the important key here, the reason why I, I thought it would be useful to start with that brief summary is because it's really Braille that changed the direction, the story for uh, blind, uh, the blind community as a whole. It's this ability to read and write that suddenly opened all these doors that before this point were only um, available to people with sight. Um, and we recognize that literacy um, is needed to participate in just about every aspect of society, uh, to be independent within your daily life at home, um, for education, employment, democratic participation, the list goes on and on. Um, and this fact is never uh, debated for sighted children. Of course, sighted children need literacy. Literacy um, is just as important for blind children. So when we're asking the question, is Braille important, what we really should be asking is, is literacy important? And we see from this little snapshot of history and how things have changed um, when Braille was introduced, we see what a role literacy plays. Yes, there are um, many different tools available to people who are blind and sighted. Audio, screen readers, talking books. Um, and the more tools that you have at your disposal that you're able to draw upon, um, the better it is for you. You have greater choice. You can choose the mode, the format, the tool that is best for a particular task. But we really want to kind of stress that it's not an either or debate. Braille remains a fundamental skill for any blind child who is able to um, be literate, just as much as print is for any sighted child who is able to be literate. So that's the first point. But now I want to go a little bit deeper um, into this question, why is Braille important for children and what role does it play in a child's life? So Braille, and if we, we again, we look at this at a more global level, literacy is important for every child, of course. Braille is important for um, um, what we call emergent literacy and learning about the world around you. So I'm going to talk really briefly about that. Sighted children are often they learn by imitation and by observing others. Basically, from the moment a sighted child is born, uh, they learn incidentally. There are many things that those of you with sight probably don't remember how you learned uh, that these things are the way they are. You just know. Um, if you think about nonverbal gestures, no one had to teach you that. You just observed it and, and you learned. Um, sighted children learn that a reading and writing system exists long before formal education begins. We have examples of this everywhere. Um, there are words on the television, ads, books, logos, signs. Um, and this exposure to literacy is important because it, it doesn't just teach children about literacy and that literacy exists, but um, by observing the world around them and others around them, they learn how literacy plays a role in the completion of countless of tasks every day in the home by just observing their parents or their siblings, for example. They learn um, through print that language, the language they speak, has a written equivalent and that there are words and books and that you can leave notes for other people to read. They learn, um, often you'll, you know, as many of us know, children learn how to recognize letters, specific letters in the alphabet, long before they actually begin school. So if we turn to blind children, if you can imagine um, not having access to this visual world around you, you're at a really big disadvantage without Braille because without Braille, blind children um, begin school without all of these essential emergent literacy skills, 
uh, without the opportunity to develop um, this background knowledge that they need to be uh, to become literate and to and to enjoy literacy and to find it relatable. Um, they won't know that a written code exists without a more direct uh, uh, effort on the part of parents and early educators um, to ensure that they're provided with a braille rich environment that is as much as possible equivalent to a print rich environment that a sighted child would have. Um, and a braille rich environment means, you know, ensuring that you label as many things as you can in the house. Um, that you purchase toys and incorporate Braille just as you would incorporate print for a sighted child and that they have opportunities to naturally come across Braille even if they can't understand what those symbols mean, just like sighted children don't know what those letters mean right away. Um, and, you know, and, and if you think about sighted children, they also often begin writing and, and using writing tools long before they actually begin formal education. So a good equivalent that Braille allows for is um, the, the notion that you can not just be a consumer of literacy, but you can also um, create written words yourself. And so for a blind child, it's really important to ensure that they have access to a brailler, that they're shown how to use it at a basic level, even before they know how to read and write, and just give them the opportunity to scribble on the brailler. So press buttons on the brailler to see that they, they can create uh, literacy just as much as they can consume it. Um, and uh, also to ensure that you take a blind child to many public places so that the words that they encounter in, um, in books and other um, venues, that their vocabulary is meaningful to them because there's many concepts um, and, and vocabulary words that may not be as meaningful to a, a blind child in, in a book uh, because they just have a more difficult time accessing those objects. Um, so something like, you know, ensuring that they can go to a petting zoo, for example, if you're reading a book about animals. And it's really, I think th the point we're trying to make here is that it's Braille that allows for a blind child to have these emergent literacy experiences that they need to develop their language, to develop background knowledge, and uh, to be literate. Um, I often encourage, I don't know if we have anyone here on the line who is a parent of a blind child, but I often encourage uh, parents to learn um, Braille as well as much as they can because um, just as a, a sighted child will we'll see their siblings and their, their parents read print, it's important that blind children don't feel isolated and they recognize that Braille is an essential tool. And they need these positive experiences as a foundation. I'm going to just list uh, three websites that I recommend for those of you who are working with children who are blind and who are uh, Braille readers or expected to be Braille readers. Um, and we'll see if we can get those to you afterwards as well. The first one is Pass to Literacy. The second one is wonderbaby.org. And the third one is the Hadley Institute for the Blind um, and Visually Impaired. So these are three organizations, three resources that are very helpful um, that provide um, Braille related resources. We can talk a bit more about that if you have questions at the end. Um, so I think I'm gonna fast forward now to talk a little bit um, more about why Braille literacy is important for children. And so if we think about again, literacy as a whole, we know that literacy is important. Having access to a written co code is important for learning phonics, spelling, uh, for understanding words that sound the same but are spelled differently, uh, to understand punctuation and different formatting conventions like indenting paragraphs. It's much harder for a blind child to to uh, learn these things if they only have access to audio. And remember, these children are going to grow up to be uh, employed adults, and they'll need to know how to structure a report or a memo. And these things are difficult to learn through audio alone. 
we also think about more traditionally visual courses like math and languages, um, Braille is, is extremely beneficial for a blind child. Um, math uh, relies on spatial orientation and spatial layout quite a bit. If you can imagine how difficult it would be to work through uh, an equation that was simply read aloud to you, you'll understand what the problem is. Um, and similarly, imagine what it would be like to learn a language if you only had access to the audio. Um, it, there are certain languages, for example, French, that have many irregular verbs or silent endings in words, and that would be very uh, difficult to appreciate if you didn't have access to um, how those words are actually uh, presented on the page. And similarly for music, um, if you simply learn by ear, you don't have access to hundreds and hundreds of years of musical scores that have been written by other people. Um, it's also, Braille is also important, important um, an important way to ensure uh, that children are included in um, and participated in their families and in their classrooms and as an important um, leisure uh, activity as well. So if you think about children, children often, sighted children often reinforce their print skills uh, through play without really realizing it by playing board games and cards and these are all providing them with opportunities to practice their reading and writing skills. And so many of these activities, many of these games and toys exist for Braille readers as well. And um, there are board games and there are Braille uh, playing cards and Braille um, learning um, activities, um, Braille uh, letter blocks and so on and so forth that allow blind children not only to develop their literacy skills, but to be to uh, participate alongside their peers and family members and to develop social skills through the process. So Braille is a, a real e equalizer when you're when you're thinking about leisure activities and social participation as well. My last point that I want to touch on here uh, relates to how um, we can support children who are learning Braille. I just wanted to provide a few tips for those of you who are working with children or who have children who are Braille users. So the first point we wanted to raise is that Braille is not just for children who are totally blind. As um, many of you probably know, most quote unquote blind people actually do have usable vision. And there are many reasons why Braille would be useful to someone with low vision. Um, you may have eye fatigue, your prognosis may be such that your vision is, is expected to decrease in the future. Uh, your reading loads may change as you uh, progress through your education. Um, your vision may fluctuate or it may be determined that for certain tasks within the classroom, children would, would benefit from Braille rather than print. For example, when you're giving a classroom presentation, um, it may not be ideal to have um, a print page right up in front of your face because it prevents you from interacting with your audience. Um, and many children have different learning styles. Um, you shouldn't assume that because a child is blind or visually impaired that they necessarily learn best through auditory means. Um, so children who um, are Braille users or expected to be Braille users need regular access to a TVI, which is a teacher for students with visual impairments who will work privately with the student to work on um, Braille literacy skills and who will also collaborate with the classroom teacher if that child is integrated into a regular classroom to ensure that that child is included as much as possible um, within literacy-based activities within the classroom. And that might just mean ensuring that materials are available in Braille um, in advance. Um, if you think about a sighted child, having access to literacy instruction once a week or once every two weeks would not be deemed sufficient. So I, I think we want to just highlight that the same goes for blind children. They need more than occasional access to a TVI to work on their Braille-related skills. And um, 
um, a, a TBI will actually conduct what is called a learning media assessment to determine whether Braille as well as other alternative formats uh, will be useful for a given child based on their needs. Um, and these assessments should be done annually because needs change. And remember, they could be accessing many different modes. Um, a few other recommendations that I just want to highlight. Um, ensure as much as possible that there are access to uh, print Braille books, both at home and in the classroom. Print Braille books are those books that have both print and Braille so that they could be read by sighted and blind individuals together. Um, so a, a, a sighted a parent or teacher could read those books in print while the blind child is feeling the Braille on the page. Um, um, if it's possible, I think we would always encourage having access to older Braille reading uh, mentors or role models. And then my last point that I wanted to highlight um, with regards to children and Braille is the IEP, which is the individual uh, Individualized Education Plan. And these are plans uh, that take um, into account any special learning supports that a child may need to succeed um, within their educational, uh, within their education. So um, parents should be encouraged to bring any questions or concerns they have. And I would even say that uh, blind children should be encouraged to participate in these meetings once they're old enough to, to be able to do that. And if Braille, uh, if you feel that Braille should be a part or at least considered, I would definitely encourage you to raise that. And if Braille is already uh, incorporated, um, ensure that um, it doesn't kind of fall into the background and that children are receiving equal access to literacy instruction. So I'm going to turn it to Jen now, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the role of Braille for adults and an interesting study that we've come across. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I, as Natalie said, we're going to talk about Braille, the role of Braille in the lives of, of adults, because as we know, um, as important as it is for children, these children grow up and become adults and, and uh, are not in, in school forever, even though some of us think, oh, wouldn't that be nice if I could, I could uh, go back to school. But um, one of the things I did want to mention quickly, and Natalie and I have both, um, neither of us have really incorporated our personal experiences with Braille in, into this, but as Natalie was talking about the importance of even things like board games, I was reminded of, and I, I can remember, I, I remember the day, I remember where I was, I was about seven, and my parents bought a Braille Monopoly, and it was like Braille in print so that I could play with my family and I didn't have to have somebody else read the cards and the, and the money to me and I was so excited I still have that at Monopoly actually <laughs> and I loved being the um, you know the person who's responsible for handing out when you buy a property and you hand out the cards well I couldn't have done that uh, without a braille version because someone else would have had to do that for me so um, I, I really identified with that <laughs> That particular comment, because I can, I like I said, I can remember the day when the monopoly arrived and how exciting it was. So um, that's just kind of a, a practical tie-in. Um, so anyway, back to the uh, back to the regularly scheduled uh, events. Um, Natalie mentioned the study that I was going to discuss, and it's known as the Ryle study. And some of you may have heard of this. It, it's a sort of quite well known within the, the field of uh, blindness education, I guess it can be called that. Um, Dr. Ruby Riles did this study in the mid-1990s, and what she basically did was um, what she surveyed adults who, um, some of whom had learned Braille when their sighted peers were learning print, and others who either hadn't learned Braille or had learned it um, as adults and, and weren't necessarily using it, um, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives. And what she found is that the proficient Braille users had higher levels of education, um, were more gainfully employed, and had higher incomes. And while this is not, I mean, it was a relatively small sample, and, and blindness is kind of a low-incidence disability, and there's not a whole lot of research that's been done, 
the results were it was sort of the overwhelming majority like the results were very conclusive that the impact and the influence of braille proficiency or really just we can say that it was literacy that that really made the difference um, for these for these adults so it's just it, it's just something to be aware of and as as natalie said you know we're we're not saying that braille is the only way to to do everything and audio never has a place and you know if you are low vision that large print never has a place that's that's certainly not what we're um what we're saying but we're simply talking about choosing the best medium for the task and considering things um, again, one of the things Natalie mentioned was with regard to children was board games, but of course, we all know as adults, we, we like to play games as well. So things like that, labeling household items, um, even again, social interaction and things like reading print braille books with, with your children or your grandchildren. Um, that's kind of another thing where braille can really be, um, is really the best the best medium to use and other other activities of daily living just such as making a grocery list um, kind of things like that where we're having something on a piece of paper is really kind of the ideal maybe solution um, written language is does tend to be more active and this is kind of a scientifically scientifically proven that reading and listening involve different processes they're they're different skill sets so you're taking in information but when you are listening you're processing one way and when and when you're reading whether it's visual or tactile there's a a different process that's that's going on that's not the same sometimes you hear the phrase um in the in the blindness world of you know listening is not literacy and as sort of a disclaimer that's not to say that audio um, it's not a criticism of audio. It's simply just whether you're sighted or blind, listening to something is different from reading. Um, so, and we focus on reading a lot, but this also does apply to writing as well, because writing involves a different skill set um, that is get, becoming more and more in demand with so much communication being done via the web and, uh, you know, you've really being able to write I, I feel like i can't stress enough how important it is to make sure that that kids and then eventually adults know how to write know how to communicate well using the written word and as as natalie mentioned at one point when she was talking about educating children when those children grow up and become adults they're going to ideally be working you know in in an environment where it matters how you present, for example, memo, memos and reports and documents and definitely having a, you know, having the ability to to write and to um, be aware of, again, such things as spelling and punctuation and formatting is really um, can re really be a crucial, a crucial skill to have. So this is also sort of evident on on a practical level when you think about taking notes in class and how much better I can remember from my student days where the classes where I took the best notes tended to be the classes that I understood the material the best because I had to process what the professor was saying and I had to write it down in a way that would make sense to me later when, when I read the notes so um, things like that and, and many people feel um, that the retention and comprehension is better when they can actually read something and this is something that Natalie alluded to when she talked about learning styles I you know again it's, it's often assumed that blind people are by nature auditory learners and I know that you know that that is that is definitely not always the case um, where there's there's some people just they just need to see it they just need to read it they need to have, have a map that they can look at to get an idea of um, of what something looks like and and that's kind of an area that we're not necessarily really touching on but braille as it connects to things like tactile maps so that kids can read diagrams and maps and and adults as well actually um you know reading reading maps and, and understanding diagrams and, and the role that braille can can play in that um so now of course you know we're, we can't have a discussion like this without without discussing technology and you know there's sort of this this um you know we talk about 
technology being, you know, replacing Braille and, and you know, is, is, is this the case? Is this not the case? Well, one thing, as much as, you know, we all, we love technology and love our, our uh, eye devices and whatever else we may use, sometimes technology bails on us. I'm sure you've all had the I, I know this, I can remember vividly when this happened to me, when I, I was going to, I was relying on a piece of technology um, and I was going to be presenting something and the battery died just before my presentation. So there are times where a paper copy is really the best viable, the best option. Um, an example I, I can think of too, that's sort of outside of the presentation world, because, you know, this, again, there's, there's a variety. I like to cook and bake and I find that I don't want to have my braille display sitting beside my bowl of cookie dough because I don't want to risk anything happening to it and I find that with recipes the best having paper copies is really the best option because it doesn't really matter so much if you get you know if the paper gets a little bit wrecked you're not talking about an expensive piece of equipment um, so Natalie mentioned the uh, the uh, scenario where you're giving a speech and uh, you need to have something that you can read, whether it's whether you're thinking of, it, you know, Braille versus large print or Braille versus audio. There are times where just having a piece of paper that you can read that you don't have to worry about the battery dying. Um, this is this is a, a good option. And and kind of by the same token, I mentioned that you know, and we've all, I am sure, again, that most, if not all of you have heard the argument that, well, with technology, you know, it's not as important. It's not as important to be able to read Braille because you can just, you know, technology will just do it for you. And there are a number of responses that I, I could make to that and, and would like to make um, besides the fact that we we don't say that to sighted children, that they don't need to learn to read because they can, just, technology will just do it for them. But what I want to emphasize here is the fact that technology actually now, because of advances in technology, it actually enhances access to Braille. So I know many Braille users say that they use Braille now more than they ever did because with the use of a Braille display, we can connect it to a computer, we can connect it to an iPad, an iPhone, and, you know, Aroga Aroga sells um, many of these devices that allow you to access all kinds of things in Braille that were never available before. So I think that's really important um, to bear in mind when you're thinking about the the value of Braille and the ways that it will be used. Because I'm sure that if I sat down with a number of Braille users and asked them how they use Braille in their everyday life, people would come up with things that that I've never even thought of. And uh, so it's there's really sort of no. Um, like what we have here, it's it's not an exhaustive list, so it, it's just something that we wanted to also point out. Um, and so Natalie is now going to, um, I sort of started with talking about, you know, the, the myth that technology could, could replace reading. And so Natalie's going to talk about other myths and misconceptions about Braille. Yeah, and I could definitely relate to... Uh some of the personal experiences you, you had mentioned, Jen, because I know that um, I've always um, had a harder time retaining information uh, through audio. And so when it came to studying when I was you know, a student growing up, I always needed access to Braille because I just felt as though I needed that uh, physical page to be able to uh, read through the information. Like you said, it's a more active way of, of reading. Um, audio can be more passive in that, you know, your, your mind could wander. So um, even in terms of learning styles, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I think a lot of Braille readers can relate to, this idea that, you know, having a Braille copy uh, for, for purposes of really understanding material and interacting with material, it can be really helpful sometimes. So um, as Jen mentioned, I'm gonna just highlight a few myths and misconceptions that we've often heard um, uh, related to Braille and, uh, and the importance of Braille. And so the first one I'm gonna tackle is a big one. And basically it comes down to, is Braille hard to learn? And I can tell you that 
I have been asked this question by almost every client I've worked with in the past. It's a very common misconception among both non-Braille reading blind uh, people and uh, sighted people as well. Um, and so I'm going to kind of encourage everyone again to think about um, print for a moment and to think about how this question would sound. It kind of sounds a little funny if you um, redirect it towards print. So what would you say if someone asked you whether print was difficult to learn? Um, you know, print is nothing but a set of kind of arbitrary lines that and squiggles and things that you've memorized at some point through your education refer to specific letters and numbers and punctuation symbols, um, but they're not they don't inherently refer to those symbols. We've just kind of created them to have meaning. Meaning, And Braille is exactly the same way. Braille, you know, there's a, a two by three matrix of dots and different combinations of these dots um, create the different symbols, letters and numbers and punctuation marks that you use to read and write. So, there, it's not any more or less difficult to learn in this way um, when compared to print. It's, it's exactly the same thing. It's just that, you know, if it's something that you don't know, you may feel as though it's more difficult because you simply don't know it. But um, there's nothing inherently easier about print. There's a lot of stigma um, associated with blindness, as we know. Uh, for uh, people who are adjusting to vision loss later on in life. And Braille is a really visible sign of blindness. It's kind of like Braille um, is, is uh, a sign of uh, someone who is unable to see. And um, a lot of the time, the stigma will prevent people um, in adulthood and older adulthood from even considering Braille as an option, not because it's not useful, but just because of this, this, these misconceptions and this stigma that they relate to, to blindness, really. And a lot of the time when this um, idea is raised, I often ask clients to think, okay, what is, it, what is it exactly about blindness that scares you or um, that's really um, concerning you the most? And if you probe deep enough, I can tell you that most people will say that the fear of vision loss is related to um, the idea that you will lose your independence and you will be unable to perform the tasks that you were able to do before, that you'll have to rely on others. So, okay, so if, if, if um, a client that I'm speaking to gets to that point where they recognize that this is what they're most concerned about, a lack of independence, well then, you know, if you start to see Braille as something that can actually allow you to regain your independence and that can increase your independence and your, your autonomy, then you'll become much more open to learning it. It's not a symbol that makes you less capable. It's a symbol that allows you to regain your capability. So it's kind of um, getting people to see it from that perspective. So, you know, whether you're learning Braille in adulthood for uh, originally, initially just for labeling things or whether you want to learn it for more extensive reading, those needs may change over time, but just don't let your fear prevent you from, from trying it in the first place. Another, um, another uh, thing I wanted to mention about Braille is that it's actually a very logical system. I would argue, um, because I was a print reader as well growing up, I read both print and Braille, I would argue that in many ways it's much more logical than print. Because um, once you learn the first 10 letters in Braille, um, learning the rest of the alphabet is actually um, fairly logical. So um, you learn your letters A to J, and then um, the next 10 letters are exactly the same 
but simply add one additional dot. And then the last six letters are exactly the same, but simply add one more additional dot. So once you have those first 10 letters, you really have a really good foundation for learning the rest of the alphabet, which is not the case in print. And then the other thing is that, uh, for those of you who are, are Braille readers, you'll know that once you've learned the first 10 letters, you've also already learned all the numbers because um, those 10 letters, those first 10 letters, A to J, become numbers when you place a, a special numeric sign before that, that symbol. So then A becomes one, for example. So understanding kind of how Braille works, um, it, it's really helpful in addressing this misconception that it's hard or difficult to learn. Another misconception that we often hear is that older people can't learn Braille. And it's much more difficult for uh, an adult and especially a senior to learn Braille. So I've taught Braille to adults and seniors and I'm not alone. I'm not, you know, any more special than other professionals. Many others have taught Braille to adults and seniors as well. Um, and I think the important thing to remember here is that um, Everything you learn in adulthood requires uh, a more concerted effort. Um, children are sponges. They pick things up very quickly, um, you know, just through exposure. Um, learning is very easy when you're young. Um, and this is a case for everything. So in adulthood, whether you want to learn a new language or a musical instrument or whatever it is that you want to learn, you're going to have to make the commitment and, um, and take the time that is needed to learn it. But that doesn't mean that it can't be done. And there's nothing um, inherently more difficult or um, about Braille um, than uh, when compared to anything else that you'd like to learn in adulthood. So there are some conditions um, in adulthood that are often kind of associated with vision loss that may make it more difficult to learn Braille. For example, if you have a very uh, significant neuropathy that um, impairs your tactile perception in your fingertips, then that may may pose a problem. But at the same time, I would still encourage you to speak to a, a vision rehabilitation specialist um, and to give it a try. Don't, don't just assume that it won't work because there, there are different techniques and, and uh, materials out there that may be able to help you. Um, a lot of the time when I begin um, teaching Braille to adults. I like to show them different tools and um, uh, different tools like reading and writing uh, tools that are available and also different technologies um, related uh, different Braille devices and uh, Braille products, board games, playing cards, Braille books. And this is to kind of encourage them to think about how uh, Braille will play a role in their, their own lives. And learning is much more meaningful and enjoyable if, um, if you can do that. And one of the things that often I show all these neat gadgets, but it's funny because one of the things that is often most interesting to, um, to students is uh, when I show them that they could label the cards in their wallet. And it's such a neat little trick that um, many Braille readers, including myself, um, do to be able to identify your cards and your wallet. Um, and it's, it's, um, I think it demonstrates how easily Braille can address a barrier that you're experiencing in your life. You can label your cards and then you're good to go. You don't need, you know, a separate device or to rely on a sighted person. Um, the last misconception I'm going to tackle is uh, something that Jen started talking about as, as well, which is this idea that Braille is archaic or bulky, and it's linked to this notion that technology is going to replace Braille. And like Jen said, um, thanks to technology, we actually have ac more access to Braille than ever before. So um, she was talking about Braille displays, which are uh, special um, devices that could uh, be connected to your computer or your mobile phone. 
and then you can have instant access to Braille wherever you go. So if that material, if that information is accessible to you online, then you can have access to it in Braille as well. Um, and the nice thing about these Braille devices is that you can configure the settings so that the information is presented to you in either uncontracted or contracted Braille, depending on what you prefer. So suddenly we have so much more access to Braille in the format that you want than ever before. These devices are often very portable. I have one that um, I actually could fit into my purse. So when I go to a meeting or a conference, I can just put the Braille display in my purse, connect it through Bluetooth to my iPhone, and take notes that way. And then I don't need to necessarily always have a big clunky laptop with me. Um, and of course, there are situations when these Braille devices are really helpful because when I'm in a meeting or a conference, I don't necessarily want to have to multitask between listening to a screen reader and listening to the people who are talking around me. And so having access to Braille is really useful. I remember once I was on um, the bus and I had forgotten my headphones at home and uh, I had my new Braille display with me and so I just took it out of my purse and I was able to still read and respond to my emails and you know I was good to go. So these Braille devices have really changed things for us and provide you with just thousands of access to thousands of books um, that we didn't have before. Um, for older learners, the nice thing is that these Braille devices um, provide a crisper form of Braille, so it's a different type of feel when you're actually reading the Braille on a Braille display, so that's another nice little advantage as well. Um, and um, we're, we're starting to see more and more of these Braille devices and low-cost Braille displays that are, are being launched. And this will bring um, Braille into the hands of um, many more people, many more consumers than ever before, including those who may not have access to funding agencies um, to afford the more expensive devices um, or to, uh, to older clients as well. So things are really changing. And thanks to technology, the future of Braille is actually um, really bright and really exciting. And I know that Aroga has access to um, many different devices, um, some of which we've used ourselves as well. So um, Braille and technology work hand in hand. So I think what we'll do now is I'll just turn it to Jen so she can tell you a little bit more about uh, Braille Literacy Canada. Um, and then maybe we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I'm, I will tell you a little bit about BLC, and um, we're getting a, a bit shorter on time, but I would like to very quickly summarize um, a, a really neat article that came out in the Braille Monitor last month, and that's, um, for anyone who's not aware, it's a publication of the National Federation of the Blind in the U.S. And in case you haven't uh, haven't noticed throughout this presentation, Natalie and I are both very, feel very strongly about Braille and its importance. And this article is, is, uh, is kind of neat because it, it sort of in a way sums up what, what one of the things that we're, you know, hoping to communicate. And it was written by a woman named Erin Jepson, who is um, a mom, a low vision mom, um, homeschooling her four kids. And she was became really frustrated by the lack of support that was available in the school system for her um, her kids who needed to learn Braille. And so what she ended up doing was sort of writing this article. It's called If Braille Were Print. And her premise is basically, you know, taking the attitudes towards Braille and saying, now imagine if that was the attitude in print, how would how would that go over? And so I'm, I'm just going to um, point out a couple of things. So she talks about um, you know, imagine saying this to a, a child who's learning print. It makes sense that you're having a hard time. And, and then it sort of goes on to talk about how, you know, of course, of course, this is hard for you. Um, I'm not aware of any techniques for reading print at a usable speed. And just, again, this is, <laughs> I'm, you know, this is sort of 
imagining this as being something that's being being very tongue in cheek. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's being referred to print sort of as a so reading is overrated. Nobody these days needs to read or write with a pencil anyway. You can just listen to audiobooks. It's a lot less work than reading and you can dictate anything you want to write. Technology is amazing these days for people like you. We all love that kind of phrasing, right? <laughs> you will get your books late always. I, I can certainly remember that kind of thing from school. Print is just so cool. This is sort of my favorite one because it's so ridiculous. Print looks cool. I see it here and there, like on elevators, and it's just so neat. It's all swoopy and round, and I like to look at it. People like you must be really special to read it. I can't believe you can just walk up to a sign with words printed on it and poof, read what it says. <laughs> Kids who read print are so beautiful and special. They open their printed books and just go for it. Unbelievable. So you kind of get the you kind of get the gist. Um, and then she talks about what print readers actually experience. How it's it's not actually like that. Um, I'd encourage you to read to to check this out. I just want to read part of her her closing paragraph because I I think this some again summarizes what we've been trying to say. Reading isn't something to be marveled at. It's something that should be expected, that should be normal. It's basic, like adequate clothing or nutrition. It's the foundation of every other form of education. So with that, um, I'll just give you a brief overview of Braille Literacy Canada. Um, and actually, I'll keep it really brief. We are an organization who is sort of reason for being is to promote Braille to ensure uh, that everybody who needs to have access to it has access to it. We're a national organization and we're run by a board of directors and then we have committees that do different um, different uh, kind of conduct the business of the organization. Um, we are always happy to have more people become involved. Uh, one of the things that we've done is um, what we've called the Brailler Bounce Initiative where people have donated Braillers that they're not um, using anymore and we've had them refurbished and then provided to um, new homes free of charge so that's uh, an initiative that we've we did in 2015 in honor of World Braille Day and then it was so successful that we kept going we are um, it, we are looking to I guess find e even more ways to promote Braille and make it even more accessible. We're uh, going to be doing more teleconferences as well um, on different Braille related subjects. So if you are interested, we have um, we have a website. It's just BrailleLiteracyCanada.ca. And on that website, we have resources. We have a, a resources page that you can click on and it has resources for parents of blind children, for Braille users, for transcribers and producers, and also for educators. And we've got a number of other things as well, and we're trying to put out a newsletter um, a few times a year, and and uh, we're, you know, getting the social media, and as I said, we're we're sort of trying to, to find new ways to reach out to members and, and to promote Braille, and so we'd love to have uh, anyone who's interested in getting involved and helping us do this, we'd love to have you get involved. And uh, our Facebook and Twitter accounts are actually pretty active, so, you know, we encourage you guys to check us out there to learn more. On Twitter, we're at BRL Lit Can, all one word, but you'll find the information on our website. And I just wanted to say something really quickly about um, teaching Braille to adults. For those of you who are uh, interested in learning about how you can become um, a vision rehabilitation professional who teaches Braille and other independent skills to um, uh, adults um, in rehabilitation settings, um, the University of Montreal has just recently launched uh, their new master's program in vision impairment and rehabilitation that will be offered this fall for the first time in English. And this is actually the master's program that I uh, completed and I'm, I'm there right now um, doing a PhD in the same field. Um, so for those of you who are interested in learning more about this program, um, there are three options, blindness, low vision, and orientation and mobility. Um, feel free to ask us questions about that as well or, or 
um, contacting me afterwards, and you'll find information about that as well on our on our webpage, BrailleLiteracyCanada.ca. Thanks for that. And I guess just to close before we take questions, again, I think sort of what we're what we're hoping to do here, and I think Natalie mentioned this as one at one point as well, is that um, you know we're talking about the importance of Braille, which you know it we do believe that it is important, but I think what what we're actually the question that we actually need to be asking is is literacy important and if the answer to that is yes which i i, I think that we could all agree on that then the importance of braille from that would just be a given yep. are there uh, are there any questions if you do have questions post them in the chat window and my colleague rob will take a look and read them out to natalie or jen If, if uh, anyone has questions and they, they want to ask them later or want to get in touch with us, we do have an email address and it's info at blc-lbc.ca and that's info at blc for Braille Literacy Canada dash lbc for Literacy Braille Canada dot ca. I also wanted to say that if you need to uh, or if you need it aroga has a ueb braille code chart available for download on our website at aroga.com um, and i wanted to thank jen and natalie as well for their time today and for those of you attending thank you for your time hopefully you uh, got something out of this webinar i really appreciate everyone's time and again you can reach myself ryan at aroga.com or um, Jen and Natalie at the information they provided as well. So if there's no more, if there are no questions, we will close the webinar. We'll give it another minute. And actually, uh, yeah, we do have a question um, uh, regarding the websites that you mentioned. Can you just uh, give those out again? Sure, I can give the uh, the Braille Literacy Canada one, and then Natalie, our our BLC one is just www.brailleliteracycanada, all one word, .ca. And then, Natalie, I think you had given some out earlier. Yes, so our Twitter handle is at, as in the at sign, uh, B-R-L for Braille, lit, L-I-T, can, C-A-N, all one word, B-R-L, lit, can. Um, and then you can also find us on Facebook um, by just searching for Braille Literacy Canada. And all of that information about our social media um, uh, links are on the uh, BLC webpage as well. Natalie, I wonder if, um, I don't know if this, the question was pertaining to this or not, but you had, when you were talking about educating kids, you had also listed a couple of websites, I think Hadley, and there were a couple of other ones. So I don't know if um, that would be worth repeating at this point. Yes, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll name the organizations and then maybe if there's a way we can um, provide the information to the um, uh, to Aroga and then they can forward it to um, people who have registered uh, for this webinar we can do that but um, Perkins School for the Blind has just an extensive list of resources related to Braille and literacy and all uh, things pertaining to uh, children with visual impairments and one of the websites that they run is called Pass to Literacy um, and on that website um, and I'm not giving the exact address because it's, it's I don't want to provide uh, incorrect information so we'll just send that to you afterwards but on uh, Pass to Literacy website you'll find tons of resources on how to support Braille both at home and in the classroom and in daily life so it's a great resource. The other one is wonderbaby.org, and that also has a lot of um, resources for early uh, Braille literacy. 
Um, and the Hadley Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired, they uh, provide courses, most of which are free of charge, not only uh, to um, blind students of all ages, including adults, but also to uh, their parents and, and professionals. So um, if you want to learn Braille, you don't have access to an instructor in your home area, they have uh, distance courses that you could take, and they also have Braille courses for parents who would like to learn some some Braille as well. There's also um, the National National Braille Press. It's uh, in the U.S. And then there's um, NBP.org. The and, yes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, and then there's um, the Braille Superstore, and that's in B.C. And it's um, I think it's Braille Bookstore. Dot, the Braille Bookstore dot com or Braille Bookstore dot com. If you Google the Braille Superstore, it, you will find it. They've yeah, got find tons it. of Braille books and all kinds of other neat Braille gadgets and games and and Braille producing devices as well. So, the National Braille Press has tons of books for all ages as well, as Jen mentioned. And there's also uh, Seedlings books for um, children. So that's Seedlings dot org. S e e d l i n g Yes. Um, and they have uh, many books for uh, Braille readers as well. And I think all of this, the ones that we've mentioned are actually, there's links to them on our website as well. So if you're sort of feeling bombarded by yeah. all, these, all <laughs> these options of where to get Braille books, um, you can go on the, the Braille Literacy Canada .ca website and there's click on Braille resources and you'll find all kinds of good stuff. And if you're an adult Braille reader who has questions about uh, UEB, Unified English Braille, and, and are kind of wondering what that's all about, um, feel free to ask us either now or contact us afterwards for more information about that too. And I actually have the chart that, that uh, Ryan was mentioning that Aroga did, and it's great. It's a really useful tool. Yeah. Great. Well, it looks like there's no more questions. So I want to thank Jen and Natalie again for your time today and, and presenting to us the importance of Braille literacy. Thank you. And thank to those you. who attended, thank you for your time. This webinar has been recorded, so it will be posted to the Aroga YouTube page, and we can send links out afterwards. So again, thank you all for your time. Thank you very thank much. You.